Thank you so much. Welcome to GMI Hub Online. It's going to be an amazing show. We're so glad that 2020 has come and gone, and now we have a new year ahead of us to grow and to bless. And we just want to thank you guys for joining us on the GMI Hub Online. Um, we're going to be talking about so many great things this year and the year ahead. So we just want to welcome you and your friends to come and share the experience. And please tell everybody about what's going on here on the GMI Hub. Uh, my name is Dale Borland. And I'm Cheryl Duick. Welcome back. Um, we have a special guest. We have a special today. Um, we have a pre-recorded interview with Kazia Myers Carter. Now you may remember her from, uh, I guess, back in July when we did an episode on rights, royalties, and licensing. And we had the pleasure of connecting with Kazia again and just doing an interview because you know, even after we had that episode, or two episodes actually, there were people that still said, but we still wanna know what are the steps if we're launching music, what are the steps we have to take? And I asked Kazia if she would be able to talk to us about that and she did do that with me. So um, without further ado, here's Kazia Myers Carter and myself in a conversation about what to do when you have new music to launch. Enjoy. Oh no, no, repetition's a good teacher. <laughs> it better be. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> repetition's a good teacher. So, okay, so the questions we're gonna ask are um, one, I'm a brand new singer, or no, brand new songwriter. I have a new song. I've had it recorded. I'm ready for it to go public. What do I need to do? Help me. <laughs> That's, so uh, first things first is that if you have a song that you've recently recorded and you are the copyright owner of, register it at SoCan. Uh, registering with SOCAN ensures that the public performance of that copyright is always um, is always tracked. And so when that public performance goes out to radio, which maybe you want it to do, or out online, which it will probably do, then you will ideally see royalties from that. Um, and outside of that, it just ensures that the administration of your copyright and of your work is protected. Um, as soon as, you know, let's backtrack a little bit about what happens and how a copyright is actually created. And the copyright is created once the recording is done. But there's no actual um, stamp of approval. There is no record. And you want to ensure that somebody else who has a very similar song or a very similar riff doesn't register that song. And then there's a conflict of who actually wrote this. So at least if you have a record and you have it down on paper, which would be registering it through SOCAN, you have um, something to go back to if there are any ever any questions about where that music came from following registering it and making sure that everybody involved in the creative process is taken care of in, in terms of a copyright percentage, then you have to think to yourself, what do I want to do with this song? Where do I want to see it? Do I want to see it sung by the masses in congregations through worship? Do I want it to become a single that I hear on the radio? Do I want both? Do I want video? You know, you really have to sit down and strategize as to what, where you want your song to be. Because if we ask for everything, then it's very likely we'll get nothing. So you have to manage your own expectations along with looking at your current, um, your current environment, your current age, your current responsibilities, and be very strategic into finding a place where your song can live and thrive and you can manage that. Um, once that is done, then you really just look on writing the next song and think about the net, the process of releasing the following track to really think about singles. Your first song is never your biggest hit. That's, it's not how it works. <laughs> to the public, that's what people think. You know, you think of um, Mary Mary, for instance, and people think Shackles 
automatically. Right. <laughs> that was not their first song. <laughs> um, that was likely their 20th song um, because it takes a while for you to gain an audience. It takes a while for people to understand your story. It takes a while for people to have an ear for your sound. And then once they do, Shackles ends up in the mall and you're like, whoa, or, you know, Kirk Franklin uh, Stomp would have been his first real single. But prior to that, Kirk Franklin was still thriving. Um, so it's about developing that audience, using your social media platforms, but not being discouraged when you've put so much hard work into your first single and the first single doesn't do as well as you think it will do. It's usually about the third single if you're pushing heavily that you're going to see a return on that. That's awesome. So we register with Silkin, we have, and then we have to have a plan of where that song, where do we want to see slash hear our song? Mm -hmm. So if they decide, so if, as a singer, I decide, okay, I want my song to be sung in churches. Where do I go from there? So if you want it to be sung in churches, you, and, I, and I'm going to ask, is this a worship song that you want sung in churches, or are you going to be singing at concerts in churches? Let's say it's a worship song. Okay. So if it's a worship song in churches, then you want to make sure that CCLI also has your song listed on their end because CCLI is the copyright representation for congregational music and lyrics. CCLI is used and is paid into by churches. The only way a royalty is ever received by a songwriter or a copyright holder is if a license fee is paid. And I think that's really important to note. Royalties don't just come out of thin air. It's because the church is paying or the radio station is paying or Spotify is paying into it. And they pay what's called a license fee. When they pay this license fee, that is disseminated to you in the form of a royalty. So make sure that your song is registered on CCLI. And if it is, then that make sure that your church is paying CCLI for licenses um, to make sure that the full circle is completed. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to see large amounts of royalties, but it does mean that it's registered, that it's noted, and that it's tracked. Um, the other, the other thing to note is that if it's worship and you're now taking that into a larger space, then you're going to want to ensure that your music is registered through CMRRA or so can reproduction. This is what we call a mechanical license. The mechanical license is a royalty that comes to you anytime there's a reproduction of your song. So let's say now that worship song is not only in your church congregation, but your church congregation or your church is pressing CDs and your song is on that CD. Well, now there's a reproduction or mechanical license that's paid by all of these licensees and that royalty then comes to you every time there's a download because download is counted as is considered a reproduction, a CD. And if we go further back, a vinyl record. Oh. Okay, so <laughs> what if it's press them? <laughs> <laughs> They're still press, you know, <laughs> cassettes, not so much, but <laughs> yeah. So what if um okay, so let's go on the other side. We wrote the song, it's now uh it is still a, a gospel song, but we kind of want it as a song that we can sing in concerts, a song that can be sung in pretty much any venue in a festival or or anything like that. Yep. So any difference on where the licensing should go? So license actually in that case has already been taken care of because you've registered it with SOCAN. Oh, excellent. Okay. Mm. So you actually don't have to register the song again. However, things to note, and this is where you as the songwriter need to hold the venue or church, we'll call a church a venue for the sake of uh, a concert, accountable the church needs to be paying a license fee and a minimum license fee is about fifty dollars it's not very much even if you're not getting paid for this gig which is negotiable you can 
talk about that. Uh, if you're about your business, get me. Um, <laughs> but if you're not, that's absolutely fine too. The church still needs to pay a license fee. And the license fee from the church is minimum $50. But you, for your work, will get approximately $75. So even though the church is paying a lot less, you're actually making money on your side. The same goes as if you have a self-promoted concert. If you have a self-promoted concert, you pay approximately $60 a year. $60 a year. But yet each time you perform, you, from a royalty standpoint, will receive about $75. That means that... One concert pays for your license for the year for a self-promoted concert. And if you have 10 concerts and you've made now $750 minus the 60, we're at about $70, $700 that we've made. That's not bad in terms of numbers. <laughs> not bad. Not, not even like, and then we take that $700 and we reinvest it into our business because we want to be a thriving gospel artist that is able to speak Jesus's name and we take that move it even further to paying for our our recording sessions to paying for our musicians that back us for paying for anything that's going to manifest itself in a way that brings a glory to God and b money into our pocket or or it, it helps to fund our our lives that's awesome okay so I have my song, I'm registered with SOCAN, and I'm covering all bases. I put my song also with CCLI, just in case the you know, church mm -hmm. wants it, because yeah. especially with COVID now, we're mm -hmm. finding that there are songs like, this is the time I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of steal a line from one of our previous mm -hmm. broadcasts, mm -hmm. where we were talking about you know, music and ministry, and especially with COVID now, and church is not being able to really sing in church like they mm -hmm. used to. It's mm -hmm. now, it's not congregational singing. Now it's a time where people concentrate on the words and they're, they're watching church at home. So mm -hmm. now the church, the songs that we would normally hear in a concert are now becoming the songs that we are watching on TV. Mm -hmm. So those same songs now I'm assuming would still be listed with CCLI as well as with SOCAN. Is that correct? Yes, so CCLI, like I said, is congregational music, but also includes the lyrics and the sheet music. So if you're watching it online, I know when I watch church online, the lyrics are actually displayed at the bottom of the screen. So that's taken care of, that's, that's your CCLI license from a church standpoint, put at good use. Um, now, if you are putting it on a platform like YouTube, for instance, YouTube is the licensee that pays into SOCAN. And they pay into SOCAN, and from that, anybody's songs that are heard on this online service that is disseminated on YouTube would be paid a royalty from SOCAN because YouTube is paying SOCAN. That's interesting. Yes, mm -hmm. that is very interesting. Now, you know, I'm going to stop here and manage some serious expectations because when we think royalties, especially online, we have to think about the number of streams within any given month. Mm -hmm. And we all know that that could be in the millions or the tens of millions. Mm -hmm. So if your song is played once during a church service, that's one, that's one song played, and let's say there are 200 different people watching it to be, um, you know, to be a little bit realistic and take into consideration different sizes of churches. So that means it's being streamed 200 times. Well, if we take that 200 streams, but then we realize that over the month, especially during COVID, the amount of streams are in the tens of millions or hundreds of millions, then very quickly your number of streams that where your song was played is very minuscule. The average royalty payout per stream prior to COVID from Spotify is 0 0.084 cents. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
And that's prior to COVID. So that was on numbers that were pretty general with everybody going to work, with people not using Spotify. Now it's going to be even less given the fact that so many more people are listening to Spotify on a daily basis. But if we use just that base and you take 0.084 multiplied by your 200 streams, we're barely at a dollar. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So we have to th we have to really manage our expectations when it comes to royalties. And then if you are a songwriter and royalties are uh, royalties coming in, you just would have to look at your strategy and pivot to where you're going to get more royalties. But that doesn't mean take your music off of the streaming services because that gives you audience. So you want them to work hand in hand. You, with streaming service bringing a larger audience than you've ever seen, that obviously will benefit you in the long run. And then if we're looking for royalties, then we actually look at places like CBC Radio. CBC Radio gives approximately $20 a spin. Oh, and the wow. reason being is, is because they pay a license fee that services the entire country or that takes into consideration the population of the entire country but yet not necessarily the entire country is listening. Mm, interesting. So, so that begs, now, now I'm gonna talk about the streaming because there was a question that popped up um, in, a, in our previous broadcast mm -hmm. that I think was answered, but based on what you're saying, I'm kind of want to get now extra clarification. So let's say now I have my song, <laughs> I've registered with Silken, I've registered, registered with CCLI, I've decided I want to put it on a platform or with a platform like a CD baby, okay. which streams to, I assume, like to Spotify and to mm -hmm. Apple and iTunes and, and whatever Laura else. And everybody else. Mm -hmm. Right. So they, they stream it out. Now, now based on that, like, I, like in terms of the breakdown, I know that of course CD, I would think CD baby takes a portion of of any royalties that come in is that correct does that make sense or yes so they wouldn't take a, a portion of royalties they would take a percentage of the money that you get from royalties so they're not of royal you receiving royalties always means that you are a copyright holder cd baby isn't a copyright holder so they'll never appear as copyright holder on any um, official document but they can say, well, from the royalties we collect, let's say is $400, CD Baby will, as an administration fee, take 10%, which would be $40, which means the payout that you receive from those royalties it equals $360. $60. Okay. Well, that makes sense then, because that was one of the questions. So now, now CD Baby would also pay it what do cd baby yeah cd baby pay out to socan as well are they a, a client of socan or they're a client yeah, they're they're affiliated with socan okay um, they are collecting again they are like your publisher okay so your publisher is not paying in your publisher ends up being a, a member at socan for instance publishers are members and they have been given the rights by the people they represent to collect and so they collect on your behalf. With CD Baby, they're collecting for all of those online stream royalties. And then that will come to you through CD Baby. And then you could receive another check that may include radio or concerts, for instance, which would come from SoCal. Okay. So I'm going to ask one more question. And this has to do with compilations. Let's say now, again, I wrote the song. <laughs> I registered, well... I wrote the song, registered with SOCAN, registered with CCI, CCLI, and then I decided I, I was given the opportunity to actually add the song or, or uh, include the song in a compilation with other artists. Okay. Does the, A, does any form of licensing change? In other words, is the pattern of, of licensing change with regards to that scenario mm -hmm. or the individual artist? Mm -hmm. um, and B, I guess, depending on how the compilation, the people running the compilation is, uh, uh, I guess, promoting the song, mm -hmm. is there a possibility of there being a, and this may be beyond what, what I should be asking you, but is yeah. there a possibility of there being a conflict with 
how royalties are paid out because of the compilation people doing something and you know yep no because there are many hands at basically yes um, and there are many parts yes okay so to answer number one there's no change in your copyright if you are a copyright holder and when i say copyright holder to define that more accurately it means if you had any part and i mean any like even if you made a suggestion of a sample or a line if you have any part you are a copyright holder if you that includes lyrics that also includes instrumentation and i bring up instrumentation because there is a misnomer within the industry that we and thankfully we have so many talented musicians in the gospel and christian industry but there is an assumption that they're just great at what they do and so that they're they're made to make your bed tracks and bed tracks being you know the backgrounds i came up with the lyrics i came up with the melody but i need somebody to add the bass and i need somebody to add the drums and i need the violin and the strings that person is just as part of the intellectual property as the person who created the lyrics and the melody line and i think we need to understand that respect because those um are what we call producers in the industry and they've actually changed the trajectory of what music sounds like current day you yeah. know um you know boy wonder who is a faith walking producer here in toronto has literally changed the trajectory of what music looks like single-handedly um just through his experiences working with drake to ed sheeran to everybody else basically um so with that being said, I digress, but with that being said, um, that's the copyright holder. The copyright holders are anybody who takes part in creating a piece. Um, and then uh, that copyright never changes. The only time that copyright changes if you, is if you're adding someone because you forgot the person who suggested that line. Um, <laughs> but otherwise, in a case of a compilation, that copyright remains the same because that copyright is associated with the song itself. Now we take that song as a whole and we put it on a compilation. Once we put in the compilation, there is no change. What we do need to make sure is that that song is registered with CMRA or so can reproduction because if we're on a compilation, CDs are going to be pressed and those are going to be sold and you need to make sure that you're receiving royalties from that. Um, the other thing that I would do as a business person, especially if, you know, gospel music is the business stream that I want to continue my career path on, I would be asking for money to be on this compilation. If you want my song, then let's negotiate terms about what, how much my song is worth to you and come up with a general understanding. And you know what, if I'm new in the industry, I may take less because I know that the compilation is going to give me more exposure. If I have a very huge single, like Tamala Man, for instance, I'm going to ask for more because I know that my name is going to give the compilation more, uh, more eyes and visibility. Okay. So I guess in a case like that, it would be very important for contracts to be made between the Absolutely. copyright holders, the compilation holders, et cetera. So there, there doesn't need to be contracts so much for the copyright holders, because like I said, that song is a unit onto itself. Okay. The contracts would have probably already been taken out care of when, when that was registered. But yes, contracts are um, essential mm -hmm. to any business, to anything that's done. Um, and it's just an understanding that is written down. You know, contract sometimes is a scary word, um, especially when you're friends. And the key is that the contract is not to, aimed at diverting interest or making things difficult. It's just to say, this is where our headspace is at this particular time. And if in 20 years from now, we've all lost our memory, we have this piece of paper that outlines what we were thinking <laughs> because yes. we're not thinking the same. You know, exactly. you could be pregnant with baby brain and I know I am appreciative of contracts because I'm like, I don't even remember what I did yesterday, let alone <laughs> like what, I, what I said. <laughs> so, yes to contracts. <laughs> yes to contracts. <laughs> um, 
to that note though also you know something that's also not always talked about is split sheets so another form of contract is a split sheet and it is when you're in the recording sessions and when you're doing this song creation a split sheet at that moment in that session outlines who did what and that helps for anybody who's registering the song especially the person if the person has many contributors to that song this helps them when they're registering to remember who was involved who was in the room who said what um, and then you can walk out of that studio session feeling a sense of peace. And I think that's also what contracts bring is a sense of peace because now I've had it, there's song creation. I've taken into consideration the person who helped with the line, the person who helped with the hook, the person who helped with the melody line, and then the producer. And when we walk away, we're all comfortable with that number. And that number equals a hundred percent. Um, when you go away and you register it, there's no discrepancy and you're less likely to have, um, a songwriter come back and say, well, I felt like I wrote that whole song. I said, mm. well, we agreed upon this, right? And and that's kind of how it stays. And that's good to note. So Kizia, just one last question. I, you, you're very passionate. I've heard you being very passionate about, about and very knowledgeable about all this and we're so, so appreciative, but how did you get into this industry? And, and, and how do you feel, like how, how, do, how has your experience in the industry affected you? So I actually got into this industry from the day I was born. <laughs> um, my parents are musicians. My mother is a pastor and my father is a well-known bass player in the gospel and Christian music scene. Um, I grew up in the pews at eight years old at practices as I'm sure many of you guys have. Uh, I was at church from Monday to Sunday and then you know all days in between. I spent countless hours surrounded by music and black gospel music. It was who I am, it's where I started. Um, Early on, when I was three years old, I started piano lessons and I am a classically trained musician. Uh, I have my Royal Conservatory training grade 10 piano. I sing, I play the flute, and I also play the violin. So music is like, it's ingrained. Great. It's, all, it's all I know. Um, but at the same time, I was often asked why I didn't remain in the gospel music world working. Um, now, I never wanted to be a performer. I had always thought that performing, it, it continues to be my place of Zen, my place of peace. Um, I would lead worship teams. That is, in my view, my worship. However, I wanted to be surrounded by music because I loved it so much. So when I went to university, I took um, communications, I took business, I took marketing, anything that would have gotten me, actually, I was working at Procter & Gamble for a while and then quit so that I could be in the music industry. And a lot of times I was asked, well, why aren't you working, you know, as a, in the church? Why aren't you working in the church? And I would often say that I felt that my light would be better in areas of darkness and in areas of darkness i mean simply that in the gospel world christian world we look at secular and gospel and so i was going into gospel into secular but with my light my shine my understanding and my me walking in the path that christ had created you know had led me to be and with the faith walk and walking in the footsteps following Christ, I always knew that I would be able to give hope where there were hopeless. Um, I was able to be the light in the darkness. The secular industry can be dark, but it's not all dark. Um, it can be dark and have those dark connotations. And I felt that I was the place of safety for a lot of people. Beyond that though, it actually gave me insight into how a mobilizing, effective business was working from a music standpoint. And coming from the church and being uh, uh, having an understanding that church music and me singing on worship teams was just what I did, there was no infrastructure that would have set me up had I wanted to be a performer or a writer to understand that this is a business. and how that business can work, 
And so I really value my position and I'm, I'm very humbled by the platform that I've been given to now take this information that I have from a corporate music industry and disseminate it to the gospel and Christian music industry so that we can see some of our greater, our, our affluent musicians and uh, you know managers actually see a career path here and understand that this infrastructure should be and can be created and, and um, supported within the gospel music scene. And from that, you know, there's a lot of information that needs to be transferred. There's a lot of dissemination of knowledge and in, in closing that knowledge gap that really needs to be there. But at the end of the day, if I am a gospel artist that wants to see my music worldwide, I need to understand the business infrastructure that's in place. And I need to understand where I can see my music, how I can see my music, what strategies I need to ensure that my music is seen by the right audiences in the right places by using the vehicles that are maybe traditionally secular. And right now we are in the time of day where we have Spotify's and we have YouTube's and Facebook's and Pandora's, but we also have radio stations. And if you are listening to WDCX, for instance, you're not going to hear all of the music you want to hear and you won't necessarily hear yourself on that station. But if you recognize that speaking the gospel in a song that it sounds like popular music, all of a sudden people don't necessarily think about where it should go or categorize it in the same way. They say it's a good song. And like Neil Armstrong says, this is the difference. You have good songs and you have not good songs. The key is to have those good songs. So I come with this information and I come with this understanding that I am here in the corporate industry and I am here in you know, now I'm working for a performing rights organization, but before I was working at Universal Music, marketing secular artists, but I'm here for a reason. And that reason is because I believe that my responsibility is to take that information, disseminate it across those who don't know and mobilize those that need the opportunity. And you're doing an awesome job with it. Kazia, thank you so much. I believe you are being a light in the industry and I believe you are being a bridge. Uh, and, you know, and it's perfect because, you know, I think we're aligned on this one. You know, we want to promote unity, community, mentorship and talent growth. And we are so glad that you're here to be with us. I'd like to thank you for watching. That was an amazing interview, you know, like because uh, he has got so many amazing points. I'm so glad we had a chance to share that with you. Um, there are some really amazing things about understanding when you have a song, what to do with it. So Cheryl, you had some thoughts on as you're watching. What, what was some of the things you kind of want to sum up what, what, what you heard or what you, what you understood? You know, what I really appreciated is that um, the way Kazia uh, talked about it, it was like, I got three points, the three errors I got out of it, which was basically, <laughs> basically it was, first of all, write, write the song. You know, you can't make money off a song unless you write it. So first, write the song. Second, record the song because the recording actually constitutes for your copyright. So write the song, record the song. And then once you've done that, register the song. And registering the song is register what so can register with CMRRA, register with CCLI, register with these organizations. These are, they're, they're called collectives that will actually um, watch out for your song and, and make sure that you do get the appropriate payment. Now, the other thing that I also got out of this, Dale, was that think about the people that are also helping you with the song. It's not just about the writers, it's also about the producer. It's also about um, you know the people that helped you with writing, the musicians and so forth, and accredit them too in in the process because you know what it's better to get a little piece of the pie rather than getting no pie at all. So that's the points that I got. And appreciating those people that help to um, sew into your ministry is only um, you know common courtesy, but uh, at the same time 
you want to acknowledge the fact that it's it's not just about you. I mean, you you create the music, but there's so many things, so many pieces of the pie that go into making a project. I absolutely agree with that. Definitely give give uh, give acknowledgments to those people who helped to make your product. Um, now we we are just so glad this interview was here for you on YouTube, and we just want you to take advantage of this because this is a, a you can watch this over and over again, and and those friends of yours who are in the music and or they themselves are songwriters, this may be an amazing little opportunity for you to just say, you know, I'm gonna sew into your ministry. So I'm gonna let you uh, know about this great video that I just saw from the GMI Hub online. Uh, so that'd be great. And we just wanna just um, ask you to do us a favor. Uh, help us by joining the community. And, and what you can do is hit that subscription button and that helps us to grow. And the more we grow, then the more people will know. And also we want you to hit the uh, notification bell. That, that, that just allows you to know when the next video is up and running. So you can get a chance to see it, you know, as soon as it comes out. And we would really appreciate that very, very much. It means so much to us to build a community. And there's more than just that. We want you to also go to the website. Uh, it's gospelmusicindustryhub.com. We want you to go there. There's a communication in there, email. You can talk to us about things. If you're a songwriter yourself and you have questions, uh, Cheryl and I, if we can't answer, we will find the person that will answer that question and you will get the answer that you need. So please write to us and, and make this community grow because really it's in your hands to make this community what it could be. So we want to just bless you and the ministry that God has in your life. So please um, join the join the gang and let, let's, let's work together and help grow what God has uh, seeded in your heart. That's right. So let's look forward together to a great 2021 where we will yes. continue to encourage unity community, mentorship, and talent growth. Thanks for watching. Good night.